Good afternoon, and welcome to this exciting side event on energy storage. First of all, I'd like to thank DOE, the Department of Energy's Office of Technology Transitions, for organizing and gathering this important panel. The staff there works hard on coordinating the technology transfer activities across the Department of Energy's extensive R&D enterprise. We'll discuss more what they lead, including the Energy Storage Grand Challenge, in detail later in the session. But to kick off, I'm Varun Sivaram. I'm a senior advisor and the head of innovation, competitiveness, and clean energy for Secretary John Kerry, the special presidential envoy for climate of the United States. The United States has demonstrated longstanding support for mission innovation. It was instrumental in its creation. Now more than ever, MI is a critical forum for commercializing new and improved technologies that will be required to meet our collective climate and clean energy ambition and foster innovative pathways to net zero economies. And you heard Secretary Kerry uh, touch on these critical themes when he spoke as the keynote for mission innovation just a couple of days ago. And he mentioned that nearly half of all the emissions reductions that we'll need for a swift global net zero transition must come from technologies that haven't yet reached market, hence the importance of mission innovation. Nearly six years ago in Paris, the Obama-Biden administration spearheaded mission innovation alongside the Paris Agreement to accelerate global clean energy R&D uh, investment and collaboration. President Biden has made clear that global climate action is a top priority of the Biden-Harris administration. And that's why he ran on the most ambitious, comprehensive climate platform of any presidential candidate in U.S. history. He rejoined the Paris Agreement just hours after being sworn in as president. And at the Leaders Climate Summit that President Biden hosted within the first 100 days of his administration, he underscored his support for mission innovation and made a raft of commitments on innovation for the United States. Now, energy storage is one of those core technologies that will be critical to a net zero transition. The outlines of that clean energy transition that we'll need are becoming clearer. The beating heart of the global energy system is going to be renewable and uh, electricity generated from increasingly cheap wind and solar plants. Other clean electricity sources will also play an important role. And wind and solar power may provide the largest share. So not only will they displace some power plants today from fossil fuels, they'll also produce far more energy overall than today's power sector. And that power is going to be used to reduce emissions in the transportation industry and building sectors. But there are two problems. First, wind and solar power are volatile. They only produce power when the wind blows or the sun shines, rather than when that energy is needed for use. And second, other sectors like transportation aren't currently configured to use electricity. For example, most cars, trucks, ships, and planes are fueled by petroleum. Energy storage can solve both problems. First, it can act as a buffer for intermittent renewable electricity generation, storing excess energy during windy or sunny times and supplying energy when demand rises. And second, energy storage technologies like batteries can displace fuels like oil, for example, to power electric vehicles. Over the last decade, the cost of lithium ion batteries, a leading storage technology, has fallen by 90%. Its use in electric vehicles and on power grids has exploded. And those trends look set to continue. Bloomberg forecasts that by 2040, a majority of global new vehicle sales will be electric, and that in the electricity sector, over $600 billion will be spent on storage alongside the growth in renewables. The US represents the world's fastest growing market for grid scale battery storage. It's gonna be the largest global market over the next three years. Energy storage is a critical part of the Biden-Harris administration's climate goals at home and abroad. We plan to continue to drive down the cost of batteries already being deployed and commercialize new and innovative technologies needed to meet our own ambitious national energy and climate goals, as well as those of our mission innovation partners. And you'll hear a lot more from my Department of Energy colleague, for example, but I'll quickly mention that our ARPA-E uh, uh, agency has a program on long duration storage called DAYS. We have a, uh, an energy storage innovation hub at Argonne National Laboratory. Um, a Department of Energy supported company, QuantumScape, is now worth more than $10 billion. And across the federal government, not just at the DOE, but elsewhere, for example, at the State Department, uh, we support work to increase the flexibility of electricity systems around the world, particularly 
in countries like India, where fast growing energy demand and renewable energy deployment mean that we have a real opportunity for a renewable transition. At the Leader Summit, you heard Secretary Kerry uh, reaffirm the U.S. commitment to innovation, and Secretary Granholm of the Department of Energy commit the U.S. to slash battery cell prices in half again by 2030. Meeting this goal will go a long way toward decarbonizing power systems and transportation systems. Electric vehicles are getting more affordable around the world, but batteries remain the single biggest cost component to customers. The United States has already made a number of other investments and goals around energy storage, including cutting the cost of clean hydrogen by 80% by 2030 and reducing the need for critical minerals in battery supply chains. And so the goals of energy storage tie directly into the themes and objectives of this next critical phase of mission innovation as members step up their collective ambition and cooperation to launch a decade of clean energy innovation and globally interconnected R&D efforts to accelerate the implementation of Paris, including the path to net zero by making clean energy uh, affordable, attractive, and accessible to all. Innovation is key. It's a key element of, a, of the U.S.'s global climate and clean energy leadership. And we'll continue to reduce our emissions. We'll slash emissions by at least half by 2030, as the president committed to, and we'll decarbonize the power sector by 2035, ultimately reaching net zero emissions economy-wide by 2050. So the U.S. only accounts for less than 15% of global emissions today. So as part of our leadership at MI and elsewhere, we plan to drive innovation collaborations that lower the cost and increase the pace of decarbonization for all countries. For this reason, President Biden has called on the U.S. to quadruple funding for clean energy research, development, and demonstration over four years, delivering long-duration storage, for example, that can complement seasonal variations that come with high levels of renewable penetration. Accelerating the development and commercialization of clean energy technologies is a whole of government effort. The Departments of Commerce and Treasury and State all play critical roles along with the Department of Energy and many other institutions. We'll hear more on this point from one of my Treasury colleagues later on. And we're pursuing and revamping bilateral and multilateral innovation partners, partnerships with our MI partners and mission innovation itself. By COP26, we intend to announce major new demonstration projects in critical technology areas spanning the globe. We'll hear from colleagues from the World Bank, another multilateral organization that helps match storage technologies to country and region specific challenges. There is tremendous opportunity to learn from these demo projects and test cases so we scale clean energy quickly enough to meet the challenge the climate crisis presents. Connecting the on the ground reality in countries and markets around the world, particularly in these fast growing emerging economies with the innovative work occurring in the United States is critical to commercialize and deploy technologies to help reduce emissions, improve lives and address climate change. So with that, I'm delighted to introduce my interagency, international and multilateral partners in this endeavor who will share more about the challenges and opportunities that create these tipping point innovations and cost reductions in energy storage. These ambitious efforts include DOE's Energy Storage Grand Challenge, Treasury's work on international financing and commercialization, and World Bank-backed projects and partnerships to prove energy storage technologies. I'd like to go now to Eric Shea, our first speaker. He is the Director for Grid Systems and Components of the U.S. Department of Energy, and he conducts cutting-edge research and development for new grid hardware technologies, including energy storage, robotics, and power electronics. Can we hand it over to you, Eric? Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Varun, for that introduction. Um, as he mentioned, I am uh, with the Office of Electricity within DOE, but I'm speaking to you today as the Technology Development Track Lead for the Energy Storage Grand Challenge. The ESGC, as an overview, um, has an intent to make the US a global leader in energy storage innovation, manufacturing, and utilization. Uh, we have a vision to may have storage technologies contribute to a US and a world energy system that is resilient, flexible, affordable, and secure. And we want to do all of that uh, by 2030. As you heard from Varun, uh, achieving this mission is a key enabler of the entire suite of decarbonization goals, especially when uh, variable uh, renewable energy sources and the electricity system become a much a greater share of the total energy supply system. 
So I wanted to put a very fine point on the need for accelerated innovation. So uh, the Biden administration um, very quickly uh, out of the box issued a goal to have the electricity sector carbon free no later than 2035. So in order to have hundreds of gigawatts of new clean resources in operation, achieving their project commercial operational date by 2035, we'll work backwards. At least three years ahead of that, you'll need the project final investment decision leading to start of construction so that uh, bulldozers can be begin building all the resources necessary to achieve full decarbonization. Two years ahead of that, you're gonna need to complete your design, secure the manufacturing commitments, and finalize any kind of supportive market structures and policies so that uh, financing can go into place uh, so that you can actually begin construction. Which brings us to today. We have fewer than nine years to validate technologies that will be operational for 10, 15, perhaps even 30 years. So any way you slice it, we have an, a, a very real need for not just accelerated innovation, but validating those technologies and deploying them. So an effort like this requires an enormous amount of coordination, even within the Department of Energy. Uh, we have a wide range of technologies uh, included in this effort. So not just bi-directional electrical storage, which includes batteries, uh, electrical me me mechanical systems like uh, pumped hydro or flywheels, uh, but also chemical and thermal storage and flexible generation and controllable loads. Basically anything that can time shift the consumption or generation of electricity. Uh, we have a wide variety of offices spanning the full range of the TRL scale from basic materials, science, research, and discovery, all the way out to systems analysis, manufacturing, and commercialization. Just to give you even more of a detail on all of the different activities across DOE, um, these are tables that you'll find in the Energy Storage Grand Challenge Roadmap Appendix that outlines all of the different efforts related to energy storage and the offices responsible for them. So you'll see the offices that uh, work on bi-directional electrical storage, including electromechanical and electrochemical uh, technologies. And while lithium ion today is a very important part of the storage picture, we're also investing in other technologies that might have other qualities like the ability to scale to very long durations or the ability to use completely different, more earth abundant supply chains like sodium or zinc. Um, beyond bi-directional electrical, there's also chemical and thermal storage technologies, a lot of heat and mechanical pro with pro attractive properties there, and then power electronics, and then flexibility within generation and loads. So there are an enormous amount of small uh, individual activities that are being coordinated from the materials and component uh, device uh, stage of technology maturity, maturity all the way out to investments, operations, markets, and end of life. The Energy Storage Grand Challenge itself is made out of five tracks. Uh, I lead the technology development track and I will uh, give you more details on that uh, as we go along. Uh, the manufacturing, the supply chain, track addresses major challenges to lowering manufacturing costs, accelerating scale up, and also looking at the entire life cycle, including recovery, second use, and end of life. The technology transitions track uh, looks at four areas, collaborating with external uh, entities to enhance access to experts, facilities, and intellectual, intellectual property at the national labs and across DOE, uh, providing industry and market analysis to spearhead commercial activity, uh, working with our interagency partners uh, to identify opportunities for collaboration and engagement, and to develop real world projects to demonstrate and validate these technologies. The policy and valuation track uh, is a, a genuine cross-cut effort to, to develop coordinated DOE-wide analysis to technical assistance um, that supports uh, effective energy storage policies, no matter what the technology, um, and uh, across a variety of market structures and regulatory structures in the US. And finally, in order to do all of this, uh, we need an effective workforce uh, from R&D to manufacturing, to deployment, operations and maintenance. Uh, all of these new technologies will require 
uh, new sets of skills, providing new opportunities for a wide uh, range of skill sets. So one of the things that is uh, unique about the energy storage grant challenge, at least for DOE, is that we are leveraging later stage commonalities. Uh, so I spoke up front about the wide variety of technologies that are included within this effort. Um, and traditionally, DOE has worked uh, in technology focused, uh, we'll call them silos for lack of a better term. Um, and all of those activities on the basic materials and device and systems users that will continue. But what we're leveraging here is the cross-cutting nature of later stage work. So once a device is connected to the grid, uh, you know it's not uh, so much important. It's not as important anymore, like what the chemistry is within the battery, so much as the battery performs as the grid needs. Uh, similarly, uh, in order to uh, identify the best kinds of market structures that um, value the types of uh, 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 sort of time shifting uh, capabilities that energy storage brings. Um, it really doesn't matter what is in the black box or what is behind the inverter providing uh, the electrons back and forth. Um, but uh, I, again, uh, these issues are common across uh, all of these technologies. And so by leveraging these commonalities uh, and, uh, and joining efforts, um, it allows us to present a much more unified and accelerated framework for accelerating integration and deployment and commercialization, all of, commercializing all of these technologies at scale. So in developing the Energy Storage Grand Challenge framework, um, we developed a set of use cases to quantify the ways in which storage uh, benefits uh, specific use users and use cases. You've often heard that storage is many different things to many different people, and that is exactly true. There is no one way in which storage uh, operates, value, is valued, or should be deployed. And so I'll go through a couple of these use cases to give you an example of what we did. So the first use case, and probably the largest one by scale for the grid, is of course facilitating grid decarbonization. And here we want to ensure grid flexibility and continued reliability um, as the electric power system evolves. And we have specific cost targets for each of these use cases. In this case, three to five cents a kilowatt hour levelized cost of storage. Uh, and these are cost targets that we are, are aiming for the technologies to achieve by 2030. Uh, some other use cases include serving remote communities. Um, these are places that are not necessarily connected to the bulk power system and are particularly dependent on delivered fuel for their energy needs. And here we have a delivered energy cost cost target. Um, and then the last one that I'll, I'll touch on is electrified mobility, of course. Uh, this includes both the onboard vehicle batteries as well as the grid uh, infrastructure needed to support uh, fast charging. Here we have, we're listing our target, the 2030 target for manufactured battery cell cost, uh, but we also have uh, performance requirements for uh, the uh, interconnecting um, hardware uh, in infrastructure. So these use cases help DOE link our R&D activities to policy objectives. So if you move left to right on this chart, You'll start with sort of the foundational R&D activities that DOE is very good at. So lithium ion, sodium ion, zinc, these are all things that my office and others invest in um, at, a, at a very early stage. And then these uh, materials innovations get rolled up into actual products that you might recognize, like batteries, uh, cylindrical or pouch cell, pump storage units, uh, et cetera. Our hope is that these products uh, can be shown to uh, shown, demonstrated, deployed to benefit all of the use cases, which in turn will achieve these higher level objectives of decarbonization, reliability, resilience, and equity. I'd also like to talk about how our laboratories uh, will be leveraged to accelerate the energy storage grand challenge pathways. Uh, over the past um, decade or more, uh, DOE has invested 
um, quite a lot in a number of facilities throughout our lab complex, from the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research that does work on uh, materials for batteries, uh, to the safety and power electronics testing at San Diego National Labs. Um, we have a wide variety of facilities and capabilities to help industry uh, accelerate their energy storage uh, time to commercialization, um, no matter what the chemistry, what the technology or what stage they're in. Um, two of the facilities that I'll touch on here uh, in more detail. Um, first is the grid storage launch pad, um, which is uh, now under construction at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And that's gonna focus on uh, materials validation at, uh, at a small uh, prototype scale to 100 kilowatts. The intent there is to test as early as possible if a new chemistry would be suitable for years uh, use on the grid. So instead of waiting until you've had to spend millions of dollars uh, for your first prototype to only to discover whether or not your chemistry is actually uh, suitable for, for grid duty cycles, uh, we can test that much earlier, like, uh, so, like when the prototype is at the button cell stage. Uh, the other facility I, I'd like to touch on is ARIES, um, the Advanced Research on Integrated Energy Systems at NREL. It's really more of a megawatt scale test facility. It's actually a very large test pad spanning uh, many, many acres. Um, and they're trying to uh, support full experimentation of integrated energy systems at scales that replicate real world scenarios. So megawatts and above, looking at actual devices in the field connected to an actual grid. Uh, and that uh, is an, a very important final step in validating that these technologies work uh, at scale. The energy storage grand challenges have itself has many challenges to overcome. Um, I'll touch on a couple of these uh, quickly. So uh, of course, few storage technologies are commercially viable in the power system at very long durations now. Um, supply chains uh, are a uh, especially critical consideration that uh, through this initiative, we were able to uh, build into very early stages of R&D uh, to make sure that the ultimate products um, uh, meet all the criteria of our supply chain um, requirements. Uh, we need validated technology and market data and operational field experience so that the commercial sector will be willing to uh, invest their own capital uh, in these new technologies. Uh, and finally, we've talked about um, the requirements for new multidisciplinary skills and expertise in order to uh, power this sector. So um, I'll sh sh highlight some of the publications that this initiative has released. So the Energy Storage Grow and Challenge Roadmap was released in December, 2020. Um, and all of the uh, sort of structures that and use cases that you've seen in this presentation are in this roadmap. We also released alongside that a grid energy storage technologies cost and performance assessment. Um, and it functions for us as sort of a, a guidepost. Um, the 2020 costs are, are sort of baseline for uh, how much we need to improve by 2030 to get a lot of these use cases achievable. Um, and then there's also an energy storage market report that provides current and projected markets for the global deployment of energy storage. Uh, if you go to the Energy Storage Grand Challenge uh, webpage, you'll, you'll have the ability to see um, the open and recent funding opportunities. And I'll note that in 2021 alone, uh, DOE has announced over $100 million of um, R&D opportunities within the energy storage space. And I'll close by saying uh, we invite you to connect with the Energy Storage Grand Challenge. Um, the link to the website is here. You'll be able to see all of our events, um, like funding opportunities like you saw on the last slide, and sign up for our email uh, mailing list so that uh, we have an opportunity to stay in touch and that you can, you, you'll be able to find uh, future venues to uh, work and communicate with us as we uh, execute on the promise of energy storage. So with that, thank you very much. And I'll turn it back over to Varun.
Terrific. Thank you, Eric. That was fascinating. Uh, and congratulations to the Department of Energy on all the great work you're doing. Um, let's now move to uh, Vicki Gunderson. Uh, she is a coordinator with the U.S. Department of Treasury's Climate Task Force in the Office of International Affairs. She facilitates cross-department coordination and advises senior U.S. government officials on climate finance and the energy transition. Uh, and she was previously the deputy director for the Office of Investment, Energy and Infrastructure at Treasury and has held positions across the U.S. government. Um, so Vicki, uh, you know, I'd appreciate if you talk about financing and commercializing technology um, from your current vantage point at the Treasury's Climate Task Force. Um, let me hand it over to you, Vicki. Thanks for having me. Uh, and thank you to the Department of uh, Energy colleagues for the invitation to speak today. Uh, my name is Vicki Gunderson, and as Vern noted, I'm a coordinator at the Department of the Treasury's International Affairs Climate Task Force. This is a, a pretty new team at the Treasury. Um, even just a few weeks ago, Secretary Yellen announced the formation of a climate hub uh, led by our first ever climate counselor, John Morton. The hub coordinates and enhances existing climate-related activities across the department, including domestic finance, econ policy, tax policy, and international affairs, where I sit. Um, our team in international affairs is, is really focused on facilitating and helping to integrate climate considerations across the range of international policies, tools, and programs. Uh, so next slide. Uh, Secretary Yellen underscored alongside President Biden at last month's Climate Leader Summit the global community has only a short time to avoid the most catastrophic effects of climate change. Uh, we need a sprinting start now to achieve a net zero emissions by mid-century. And you've heard a little bit about that already. As we look to achieve net zero emissions, the steps countries take this year to set the world up for success will make all of the difference. That first step really is about decarbonization of the power sector and transitioning to cleaner sources of energy. According to the International Energy Agency, Energy Agency, almost 40% of global carbon dioxide emissions come from the power sector. And as you can see from this graph, 29% come from coal-fired power alone. We must transition the power sector away from coal and to utilize low carbon electricity generation sources. Looking at other sectors, transportation, buildings, even industry, transitioning their primary energy use to electricity will help to decarbonize those sectors and ultimately put us on that path to net zero by mid-century. Deep carbonization of the electricity sector is, is key and will require electricity systems to be flexible while remaining affordable, particularly for the most vulnerable global populations. And I'm going to argue today that energy storage is one of those key technologies to making this all happen. Uh, next slide. As Varun noted and, and Eric underscored, solar and wind are cost competitive today in almost every global service territory, jurisdiction, country, market, however you define those particular areas and your scope um, as a senior official, a industry professional, or a, a company out there in the world. Uh, just last year, the International Renewable Energy Agency reported that despite the global pandemic, the world added 261 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity almost 50% higher than in 2019. Solar is leading the new source of renewable electricity. 127 gigawatts was installed. And this is followed by wind with 111 gigawatts. The US, a similar trends, 15 gigawatts of solar added, 14 gigawatts of wind. And really, renewable energy is outpacing fossil fuel electricity generation and added capacity every year. It accounts for more and has for almost the last five years. Interestingly, in 2020, North America, Europe, and Eurasia all had net decommissioning of non-renewable electricity sources. So next slide. As you think about intermittent renewable penetration, increasing, decreasing use of thermal generation, um, the utilities are looking for grid management solutions. Um, as shown in this plot, which is a bit wonky, but I think underscores the point, especially for stationary storage, the wide range of tools or use cases, as Eric noted, and I'll underscore, that energy storage technologies can provide. Varying power and rating energies. So not all batteries, not all storage systems are, are, are the same. They have different functionality and identifying, utilizing, and scaling the right tool, the right technology for the right use case is really important. 
Initial use cases for global stationary storage have really been focused on ancillary services markets, those, those short uh, requests for time, frequency response, voltage management, and in some cases for buildings and other things, arbitrage to take advantage of time of use prices in that mid-range. Uh, it's been concentrated in places where there are market signals, price signals, and the value for that service is defined. However, not every market is structured that way globally. Uh, valuing energy storage in order to send that market signal to drive deployment is critical. Batteries, I, I really think, are uniquely positioned to provide many of these services. If you look at this graphic, uh, they span multiple durations, multiple power ratings. They offer a flexibility that can be very well utilized outside of the limited applications of pumped hydro, which accounts for almost, almost all uh, storage around the world. But you need unique geological configurations. You need the time to do that. Uh, they're not readily deployed in every market or in jurisdiction around the world. Use cases and, and deployment of storage have really benefited from the cost of lithium ion batteries in particular coming down. This has been driven by the economies of scale of electric vehicles. Uh, I think Varin said 90% in the last few years. However, deep decarbonization will require that long duration storage, that four to eight hour window to, to maybe even cover that span when the, the sun goes down and the wind hasn't quite started to, to blow as effectively in those late hours in the evening. And as such, new battery chemistries will be particularly useful. And plugging into what the Department of Energy is doing, the research, and being able to scale those will be important. But we need to expedite that technology transition from the lab to the pilot to the demonstration, commercialization, ultimately final deployment, global deployment, where you start to utilize all of those great financing tools, project finance and other mechanisms. As we look to get there, governments, development finance institutions, such as the World Bank, have a role to play in bridging these market gaps. By financing pilot and demonstration projects, providing technical assistance to utilities and stakeholders, and looking to deploy storage technology, technologies that increase market demand for these products. Uh, next slide. That combo, as I talked about, of intermittent resources, plus loss of thermal power, um, those black start capabilities, ancillary services, et cetera, and a decreasing battery storage costs are really driving global development, um, in particular for battery stationary storage. So you can see from this plot, data produced by the Bloomberg New Energy Finance. It's described, um, as you can see in this graph, uh, in 2020, battery stationary storage deployments reached an all-time installed capacity high, uh, 5.3 gigawatts, 10.7 gigawatt hours of energy storage were added to the global electricity system. Uh, it's predicted even next year, this year, this year alone, I should say, uh, 9.7 gigs, 9.9 .9 gigawatt hours of new capacity will be added. And over the next three years, the market is expected to grow at a 37% gigawatt. 37%. The US will become a global leader. Uh, next year, it'll account for, uh, predicted to account for roughly 40% of all global energy storage capacity. As Eric and his team have noted, we have some of those lessons learned, both from our laboratories, the utilities, the states, and at the federal level, to understand what's needed in order to drive that growth. However, global supply chains for lithium ion batteries are concentrated in a handful of markets, and the majority of manufacturing is, is concentrated in a couple of places. As the United States looks and other actors looked to what we're going to need for our systems, investment in next generation of energy, technology, energy storage technologies, those new chemistries, including for long duration, are really important. And as Eric noted, really position the United States to resume leadership in these key sectors and offer a new way to engage with our global partners. Again, decommissioning, of existing carbon intensive electricity generation, added renewable energy capacity, long-term policy signals, and an economy focused on catalyzing innovation are key drivers with energy storage markets around the world. The climate crisis presents a, a unique challenge uh, and a valuable opportunity to create millions of jobs, strengthen working communities, and achieve environmental justice. Next slide. And part of that, the key will be financing, public and private. Also critical to accelerate that progress toward net zero emissions future and catalyze investment in renewable energy and energy storage systems. We can now succeed 
in achieving our global goals for climate change if we don't have a credible plan for mobilizing money that is required. At the Climate Leader Summit, President Biden launched the first U.S. International Climate Finance Plan. It's focused um, on specifically thinking about international climate finance and how to leverage whole of government expertise and resources. As the world's largest economy, the United States can play a critical role in mobilizing climate finance, especially for the world's poorest and most vulnerable communities. The International Climate Finance Plan uh, is a government strategy and a vision for climate finance out to the 2025 horizon. It outlines key steps, instruments, things the government, the US government will be doing to mobilize climate finance, to tackle climate change, to support the Paris line financial flows, and to signal to other governments, institutions, stakeholders that the US intends to work closely with all of you to deploy climate finance more efficiently and with the highest impact. I won't go into the details of the plan. It covers a host of things from scaling up climate finance to mobilizing private sector to taking steps to end international financing of carbon intensive fossil fuels, uh, as well as making international capital flows consistent with low emissions climate resilient pathways plus a bunch of wonky stuff about defining and measuring and reporting on climate finance. You can find the report online, but I'll highlight a couple, a couple of things that Treasury is offering to do, which I think will be relevant, uh, particularly following who's speaking after me. Uh, most notably, Treasury leads participation in the multilateral development banks, one of the largest sources of public finance. Uh, part of our commitment under the US International Climate Finance Plan will be directing our executive director offices to work with partners to help promote the institutions, the implementation of ambitious climate finance targets and policies. We'll be supporting additional private sector financing for quality infrastructure, storage systems being included and development that incorporates economic, social and government standards. Additionally, part of that market signal in this tr energy transition and achieving global net zero emissions is sending market signals about the things that we're, we're looking to, to decommission. Um, Treasury will be providing guidance on fossil fuel energy activities, and we'll use our voice and our vote to encourage the MDBs to phase out such support for such projects. Uh, next slide. In closing, as we protect the livelihood around the world and keep ourselves on a path towards uh, one point, less than 1.5 degrees C, we must get on that path today. Uh, we need to set ambitious, net zero goals. We need to electrify as many, as many sectors as possible. We need to decarbonize the electricity sector with renewables and storage solutions. We need to mobilize public financing to mitigate those effects. And we need to do it together. At the end, we can only achieve our goals if curtailing, of curtailing climate change through collective action. And mission innovation is a great example. Uh, we need to deploy innovative technologies and energy storage as part of that solution, a critical part. As a global community, we have to set ambitious targets, set goals, work together and, and really sprint uh, towards a better, safer, cleaner future. I look forward and we at the Treasury look forward to meeting this challenge together. Um, last slide, thank you so much. I look forward to continuing the discussion. Over to you, Varun. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Vicky. That, that was a phenomenal presentation. Really exciting work the Treasury is leading, and we are thrilled to, to partner with you uh, from the Special Envoy's Office on the International Climate Finance Plan. Now let's go, as you previewed, let's go to the World Bank. Let's go to Dr. Chandrasekhar Govindarajulu, who leads the Global Battery Storage Program at the World Bank. Um, he has more than 20 years of experience working at the World Bank and the International Finance Corporation on energy efficiency, energy access, and renewable energy across 15 countries in South Asia, East Asia, the Middle East, and North Africa. He leads the Energy Climate Finance Team, which is responsible for mobilizing climate finance from the Climate Investment Funds, the Green Climate Fund, and other sources for the energy and extractives practice at the World Bank. Over to you, Chatra. Uh, thank you, Arun. And uh, thanks, Vicky, uh, for a uh, uh, nice uh, leg up for my presentation. So from the World Bank's uh, perspective, uh, emerging energy storage technologies are a critical resource for developing countries uh, to transition their energy systems to a higher share of renewable energy. Uh, 
um, and eventually achieve the global net zero emissions in line with Paris Agreement. Equally, I would say, energy storage also creates opportunities for meeting the needs of the 800 million or so unelectrified people, mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa, which is meeting the SDG 7 uh, goals of the US, uh, of the UN, uh, through mini-grid and other innovative solutions. Battery storage is a, a unique advantage we feel um, over other sources of flexibility in the power systems due to its fast response, suitable uh, suited to address the variability of renewable energy and the modularity, uh, allowing it to be scaled up, deployed easily. Uh, it has evolved uh, favorable solutions in developing countries, uh, primarily due to the limited, uh, as I mentioned, flexibility options. Despite these uh, very positive uh, trends, uh, we are still not there yet in many of the developing countries uh, because of uh, fragile grids, um, environmental conditions, low capacity, and so on. So, the risk for therefore the risk for battery storage in uh, in developing countries is uh, is still high. Uh, it's perceived as high, and uh, there's a lot of work to be done by the World Bank and our development partners in getting over this barrier, market barrier. So there is a clear need to catalyze new market for batteries uh, and other energy storage solutions that are suitable for energy grids in, a, in, in our developing countries. So the World Bank's energy program, energy storage program is designed uh, in the form of two pillars. The first one is uh, investments. And the, uh, there the idea is really to get some of these kickstart projects and programs going in our developing countries. Uh, we see a lot of demand, both from middle-income countries like India and South Africa, who are trying to integrate ever greater amounts of renewable energy in their grid and are looking for options to uh, increase the flexibility and battery storage is one among uh, the other options and really exciting because of the cost trends and uh, convenience and so on. Uh, equally, we see the interest among the lower, de least developed countries and fragile countries as well, uh, because they are uh, they are often burning a lot of uh, heavy fuel oil, and uh, solar plus storage offers a very uh, economical solution to overcome um, their their energy access issues. So, in addition to the investment side. Uh, which we work very closely with the climate investment funds and the other other uh, global funds uh, to make this possible uh, make this possible in our developing countries we have a second work stream which is called the energy storage partnership which is focused on developing a knowledge base and technical capacity uh, for energy storage uh, you know through cooperation and uh, stakeholder engagement so we have uh, designed these programs in such a way that there is close complementarity between these two programs. Uh, so we try to distill lessons from across the world uh, to influence the, the work program of our energy storage partnership. And equally, we, uh, we, design, the, uh, we design the work program um, and then bring back the lessons to, uh, to bear on the projects that are being developed in, uh, in our countries, in our, in our client countries. So in, the, in terms of our portfolio of battery storage, it is pretty diverse. We have hybrid projects in fragile countries, such as Central African Republic, projects in small island nations, such as Pacific Islands, Comoros, Maldives, mini grids in Sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, as well, um, large scale, uh, utility scale projects uh, in South Africa, uh, in India coming up, and so on, and Ukraine. Uh, to coming up, so on. So, so overall, we have already financed about uh, committed financing for about 2.75 gigawatt hours of uh, battery storage, and we have an additional uh, two, two and a half gigawatts and a further two gigawatts. Overall, about seven gigawatt hours, I would say. That's where we are uh, now. Coming back to the energy storage partnership, uh, so this is really in order to respond to the client needs on the knowledge agenda for energy storage. The World Bank and the Energy Storage Energy Sector Management Assistance Program (ESMAP) established the ESP um, in 2019 to help respond to deployment of uh, 
diplomat of energy storage and bring new technologies to developing countries' power systems. This partnership aims at fostering international cooperation in four areas, I would say broadly, a technology research, development and demonstration, uh, system integration and planning tools, policies, regulation and procurement, enabling systems for management and sustainability. As of now, uh, we have uh, 36 partners globally, uh, including partners from the US, the Energy Storage Association is a partner, as well as the National Renewable Energy Lab is a partner, and we welcome other US partners. And uh, we have uh, European partners um, like the UK um, Bureau, you know, Business and Industry Department, Faraday Institute, uh, and so on. Uh, we also have, have developing country partners like the Solar Energy Corporation of India, the Moroccan Solar Energy Agency, uh, and many others. Uh, CSIR, uh, Mukulu is from CSIR. CSIR South Africa is, a, is one of our key partners as well. So we have already been operating for a year. Um, so the main outcomes so far are we have created a series of knowledge products um, on policy and regulations, uh, warranties, uh, which is a key issue um, in, uh, in uh, you know, de-risking projects, uh, reuse and recycling, which comes up all the time, given the, the type of metals and materials that are used for our storage, for lithium-ion especially, safety, given the fire incidents that we have seen globally, including in the US. And it's, uh, so we have produced these, um, uh, many, some of them are, each of them are led by different ESP partners. Some of them are led by the World Bank, some by other partners. Uh, in addition, we have uh, launched a very interesting program uh, called Women in Energy Storage Mentoring Program. Uh, energy sector is, uh, you know, doesn't employ a lot of women and uh, one of the, and the energy storage is not different. So we have, uh, we have uh, started this mentoring program um, and uh, 25 women uh, from, from all over the world were selected for this program and are undergoing men mentorship. To understand, uh, you know, nuances of battery storage. Some of them are involved in battery projects. Uh, my mentee uh, is involved in uh, implementing a battery storage uh, project in Lebanon, solar pool battery storage ba uh, project in Lebanon. So we have also um, developed an online tool uh, to size energy storage in solar and storage hybrid projects. Um, and finally, and uh, a point that I'm going to dwell a little bit further on is uh, we are supporting clients on energy storage test beds to showcase different battery storage technologies in different environments and on the ground capacity building on operation and maintenance of energy storage technologies. So this is something called the Global Network of Energy Storage Test Beds, NEST initiative. So as you would realize, uh, now the path is being led by lithium ion batteries and cost reductions are quite dramatic uh, and they tend to be also the projects of uh, choice in our client countries given the track record uh, people want their first project to be successful uh, but if you want to get over that and go to new innovative technologies and especially long duration technologies especially technologies that could perform well in uh, you know higher air temperature conditions uh, poor grid conditions and requiring lower maintenance. So we need to be we need to be pushing uh, um, pushing the button on innovation, and that's where the that's where the that's where we hope the test bed will make a difference. So the test bed would um, you know testing different uh, points, different uh, technologies would lower the barriers to performance verification for innovative technologies in new markets. So we are seeking to develop uh, energy storage test beds in. Morocco, India, and South Africa, so that we can reduce the barriers for introduction of new technologies. So these will be facilities with capability to operate energy storage systems with controllable uh, and standardized system configurations, use cases, and operational and environmental conditions, allowing developing countries to assess energy storage performance under realistic uh, local grid conditions at low cost and manageable uh, scale. Uh, so the objectives are uh, first enable cost, uh, low cost demonstration and performance verification because doing it directly for a zinc air or a flow battery at a high large scale is risky. 
So doing it at a, a smaller scale will help you sort through risks for safety, functionality, and profitability. And also, this is a fast-changing landscape, as you will appreciate. So allow the pace of performance demonstration to keep up with the rate of change in the global energy storage uh, landscape. Uh, provide performance information and that informs instruments for risk reduction, such as warranties and so on. So we get better commercial um, you know, traction for these projects. And finally, build local technical and institutional capacity. So that's really the, that is really a, a, the point uh, that we, I wanted to emphasize. So battery storage um, deployed in stationary applications are based on uh, you know, designs for electric vehicles, uh, primarily these days. And one of the main objectives of the energy storage partnership is to move the, uh, the research that is now led by global institutions and fundamentally focused on electric vehicles to more towards stationary storage applications and the needs of developing countries so that their costs and those technologies that are meant that are going to be making a difference in those conditions can make a you know make a make a move forward. So by verifying performance, the test beds will uh, reduce the perception of technology risk um, and therefore ease the market entry for new commercially um, commercially promising energy storage technologies. So we will have different operating models. Uh, there could be a private sector investment in this. Uh, there could be some of this could come through public public projects. Uh, so these are this will depend on uh, the context and uh, and the conditions in which um, how we design these uh, three test beds in these three countries, so that they can uh, they can be useful and uh, help push the technology envelope in these three countries. So um, I will I think I will stop there for now, and uh, I'm very pleased to say that we very close we work very closely with the climate investment funds as well as other climate funds. And where we have uh, launched CIF, uh, the Climate Investment Funds have launched a global energy storage program. In fact, they had a session this morning. So we would, uh, we would, uh, we would hope that more funding is available for us to be able to, um, to take, this, uh, take this program to the next level and see greater levels of deployment in our, in our client countries. Uh, thank you very much. Sunlight. Wind, water. Morocco is bringing with clean energy sources that are both infinite and renewable. It boasts several wind farms, either under construction or already operational. Most hydraulic plants are operational, and many solar energy projects are at various stages, thus making the kingdom's commitment to clean energy a reality. Mazen leverages its successful experiences as well as a network of industrial and international partnerships to serve as an accelerator for the path to market of solar, wind and storage technologies. Its dedicated demonstration platform over 200 hectares at the heart of Noroar Zazat Solar Complex is an ideal setting for upcoming technologies, capacity building and also industrial and local industrial involvement for the benefit of local ecosystems. Mazen is proud to partner with the World Bank SMAP program as a battery test bench, part of the Global Network of Energy Storage Test Beds or NESTS. Mazen's demonstration platform is already home to innovative storage technology deployments, such as Unidos-funded 500 kilowatt-hour vanadium flow battery from Sumitomo, 
but also Azalea's 330 kilowatt hour phase change material thermal energy storage battery. Mazen is looking forward to host other battery storage demonstrators through its partnership with the World Bank SMAP program. With inexpensive renewable energy generation, competitively priced storage will form an ideal combination for a fully renewable solution for Africa. The opportunity that lies ahead of us should be mindful of Africa's constraints and development urgencies and needs, and in particular, local job creation and technology transfer. The renewable energy generation and storage revolution that lies ahead of us should be an inclusive and holistic development opportunity for beneficiary communities all over Africa. Thank you. As a signatory to the Climate Change Paris Agreement, South Africa is committed to reducing its carbon emissions. Therefore, in the past 10 years, South Africa has bolstered its energy supply by introducing renewables into its energy mix. This energy mix constitutes renewable energy sources dominated by wind, solar PV, biomass and hydropower that contribute to the country's greening of its national energy grid. For South Africa to reap the full benefits of renewable energy, an efficient and effective utility-scale energy storage system needs to be developed. The transformative impact of renewable energy will truly be felt when surplus energy has been effectively stored and can be used at times when demand exceeds supply. Energy storage will undoubtedly have a positive impact on an economy when pressure on the grid is alleviated, leading to minimized disruption of industrial outputs. The bottom line is that effective and efficient storage will require more than a car battery. It demands innovation. The Council for Scientific and Industrial Research has heeded this energy call. As a member of the Energy Storage Partnership, in collaboration with VITO, CSIR has embarked on a project to research and develop South Africa's first test bed for electrical storage. This project is developed with the framework of the World Bank Energy Storage Partnership and is aligned to the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy Risk Mitigation Program. The CSIR seeks to achieve four strategic objectives, namely Demonstration of the effectiveness of battery energy storage at grid scale Testing of individual battery technologies under real team operating test regimes the establishment of the probable life cycle of various technologies under real working conditions, and the establishment of the round-trip efficiencies of various units. CSIR researchers are currently well ahead of developing material-based technologies which make up the components of battery cells, intend to improve the electrochemical properties used in energy storage systems. South Africa has an abundance of materials such as manganese and other mineral resources. The CSIR has capitalized on this advantage and is experimenting and producing various materials with manganese that can be used to best store energy. Our drive to bring together experts both locally and globally echoes our commitment to excellent, efficient, enabling partner-driven initiatives that seek to outperform. I'd like to introduce Dr. Mkulu Mate, Chief Researcher and Program Manager of the Living Energy Lab Platform of the Energy Center at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in South Africa. His current research focuses on the synthesis and characterization of nanomaterials for energy applications like fuel cells and batteries. Dr. Mate is a current chair of the advisory board of the Process Energy and Environmental Station at the University of Johannesburg. So would love to hear you talk about the new energy storage testbed capability being funded by the World Bank in South Africa. Good afternoon and uh, thanks to the Department of Energy for the opportunity to share the events and the developments that are happening in South Africa on indoor and outdoor testbed, accelerating technology to market and serving the power sector needs for the country. 
I will jump right in and indicate uh, the presentation outline, which is uh, as is there. And I'll be emphasizing more on the South African energy storage activities and touching on our international collaboration with uh, VITO. As other speakers had already indicated about lack of access to electricity, you can see that uh, the numbers have uh, grown from 800 million to now about 1.2 billion. And uh, the majority of those, about 600 million, are in sub-Saharan Africa. And that offers itself as an opportunity for storage because you'll be looking at different ways in which we can be using storage to the grid with renewables and also using storage as a uh, standalone. Sadly, you can see that when we are looking at the global lithium ion battery cell manufacturing, None of uh, the activities are happening in Africa and part of uh, South America. You can see where they are concentrated. And if you're looking at uh, lithium ion phosphate, which is the one that's popular for storage, uh, stationary storage, it would be ideal to consider having such capabilities built in Africa. Why build those capabilities in Africa? You can see the storage market for Africa growth projection is that by 2025, it would be about two to three gigawatt with uh, cost revenues of uh, four to five billion. The analysis would show that uh, the growth is going to be mostly in stationary storage. And so from uh, where I'm coming from, the Living Energy Lab uh, project is uh, a new entity that is combining a project that are linked to solar PV, energy efficiency, and electric vehicles in that first cluster. And in the second cluster, you can see that we have mini IRP and thermal storage modeling. And then uh, the test beds would be part of the energy storage test bed and uh, battery chemistries, where we are currently working on establishing an indoor test bed facility for cells and module testing. And then later on, we'll be working towards establishing the outdoor test facility with uh, the World Bank Initiative, where we'll be demonstrating different chemistries for stationary application. We have heard from the talks of Eric as to how fast the technologies is evolving. And if you are looking between 2016 and uh, 2030 along the Y, you can see that uh, the advanced lithium is uh, getting uh, matured and then uh, you are working towards higher safety levels. And you can see that in the future, lithium air batteries and lithium sulfur batteries and also when we are looking at uh, post-lithium, it's going to be solid state batteries for EVs and other batteries would be working for stationary. And therefore it makes sense that uh, there is always development and deployment and testing and piloting of uh, these uh, battery chemistries. So in as far as the South African energy, land store, energy storage landscape goes, there is a, a venture capital or an industrial development corporation that had conducted a study where they have identified the area of use, the purpose of use, and the range. And suffice it to say that I will just concentrate on the bottom one on the gray uh, table there, which shows the customer energy management system which is for this uh, lower range. And then you can imagine that the people that don't have electricity would be able to derive value from those things. But when you're looking at the right, at our utility company, which is called ASCOM, they are already having a BYD lithium ion battery that they are testing here at the top, but they also have the vanadium redox flow and the zinc bromide uh, flow battery that uh, are being tested. We have heard from other speakers about the existence of microgrids and uh, companies like Eaton, ABB and others have microgrids on their campuses so that they can continue to do their manufacturing with the power outages and disturbances that they'll be experiencing. 
So with regards to the time frames of introduction of technologies in South Africa, let me just focus on the lithium ion. You can see that uh, the, there's going to be a growth from uh, this year up to over the next 10 years, up to 2031. The flow batteries in terms of vanadium and zinc uh, bromide are also going to be growing. And then towards uh, the 2025 to 2031, you'll be looking at uh, lithium metal batteries and metal air batteries. So why do we want to have this energy storage test bed? We know that normally there are desired performances from batteries, and then we also have those that are real measured performances. So if we look at the spider web on uh, our left, we can see your right, where we have performance and reliability testing. When we look at cycle life, it, the, the real performance is low, and in essence, we would want the cycle life to improve. And then also, if you are looking at the calendar life, we would also want it to, prove, to improve. And you can see that when it comes to safety, there has been a lot of uh, uh, development and progress that has been made also with energy density. That in itself affords opportunities for the future where you can also see that according to the calendar life, there is uh, a time and temper and resistance dependence, but which is uh, underpinned by the temperature. And you can see that at lower temperatures, the performance are better and over a longer time, and then we don't have an increase in resistance. So we at the CSIR have uh, these existing facilities, and uh, we are looking at uh, this new space where we would be expanding to do other testing in terms of uh, module testing and others. So from our collaboration with Vito, we have uh, a three-year Flemish grant, Flemish government uh, funded program, which is also an example of international collaboration. So the goal is to offer services for low capacity clients. And then from that, they will benefit. They'll see benefits from uh, battery storage being demonstrated in developing countries. And then through the test bed facility, we would uh, build the capacity in terms of uh, energy storage uh, knowledge, but also expand the market. So for the scope of the testing for now, we would be looking at cell and module testing for the indoor test bed. And later on with uh, the developments with the World Bank, we would be looking at outdoor test bed. And then uh, uh, with this project, we would be able to bridge the, the gap to bring new knowledge and uh, also to bring new technologies for implementation. So we will establish a testing infrastructure. We will support innovation in the field of energy storage and microgrids. And through all of this, there will be knowledge and tools for the assessment of business cases and sustainability of storage solutions. And overall, the test bed will be a training ground for energy storage operators and end users. And so what we have in uh, at the CSIR are currently, we have these capabilities in terms of cell testing, pouch, pouch cells, uh, manufacturing, and then also energy management system. We are building the skills in battery module uh, pack and others. And, uh, but more importantly, the services that are identified for testing initially are performance and reliability as seen from uh, the spider web diagram and also work on aging testing, calendar life, and also the cycle life, as we have indicated that these remain some of the challenges to be addressed in the testing regime. And so the, our utility company, ESCOM, has uh, a test facility, as uh, mentioned by Chandra in his talk, and there they are demonstrating the effectiveness of battery energy storage at grid scale. And they are also testing individual battery technology, technologies under the real testing regimes. And why they are doing that is with the aim to test 
all under identical low discharge profiles over a minimum period of three years so that they can see how deployment would, would look like. And I would like by concluding to say that uh, the lack of uh, third party testing facilities and energy storage testing skills are a challenge to be addressed in the developing countries where we have uh, limited infrastructure because the equipment is expensive and we have heard from Vicky that there are challenges with financing. But more importantly, we would start to start to have locally manufactured batteries. So I'll conclude by saying developing countries have awareness of the energy storage landscape, but uh, they have isolated activities with pockets of growth and excellence emerging. With the market analysis, the local uh, energy storage stakeholders need third party testing. And for technical analysis, there's lack of adequate skills in energy storage and testing expertise. But more importantly, jobs will be created with the projected market growth. And on that note, I would acknowledge the funding from uh, the Department of Science and Innovation, international funding, the opportunity to talk here, and uh, the collaborators with whom we are joining on making energy storage a reality. And I would thank the production team and the organizers for the opportunity to share my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, and cool. That was fascinating. And now I'd like to uh, invite all of our panelists today to join in a discussion of the topics that we've heard. The first topic takes off from what I heard from Chandra and Mukulu, and honestly also uh, from Eric and from Vicky. It's about the biggest opportunity and need for next generation energy storage, which is in fast growing emerging economies. And the question is, how do we connect the innovation that we talked about earlier on, the new materials, for example, and new approaches that will be post lithium ion technologies, for example, for long duration grid storage. How do we connect that to the places where flexibility is most needed and where capital is most scarce? For example, in fast growing emerging economies in South Asia, in India, for example. What would it take to mobilize the financial capital to take some technology risk and invest in demonstration projects and building on what Chandra mentioned and what Nkulu mentioned about test beds to make sure that we can test those technologies in the actual conditions they will be used. I'd love to hear from any or all of you on this topic with as much concrete examples as possible. Can I, uh, would anyone like to start or, or I, can, I can jump in and select someone? Maybe I can start. Thanks, Chandra. Sure. Uh, this is the this is the real challenge, uh, Varun. Uh, as we discuss with clients, even in middle-income countries, uh, when we start discussing storage, uh, the track record issue comes up. Uh, they want to, even if it is concessional financing, uh, the risks are high, and they would like to go with a, a tried and established technology, which at least has safe. 10 megawatts, even if they are very generous, 5 megawatts of something that is already operating, commissioned and showing. So it is a, it is a critical barrier to overcome. And uh, one way would be to do it at a scale, a smaller scale, uh, in, in the sense that, for example, we are now discussing in Ukraine, a large uh, you know, uh, operation, battery storage operation. Uh, they are interested, for example, to try out zinc air batteries for part of part of their part of their program because they feel that that is really helpful in uh, you know because of the charge discharge cycle offered by zinc air and also other advantages like cost and maintenance and so on. It's more amenable to that for part of the program. Uh, they are ready to do that. So that is one way to do it. And obviously, uh, concessional climate finance plays a key role. And we are funding this project not only from IDRD resources, but also from uh, climate finance resources from the, the Global Energy Storage Program. Thanks. Thank you, Chandra. I, I was curious, Mkulu, if you had a thought on this. 
Yes, th th thanks, Varun. My, my thought is going to be the importance of uh, piloting and demonstration is essential where you are able to, at the same time, build on uh, industries that are not existing in those developing countries, when you are also skilling the people, because we have realized that the new technologies, as uh, Eric indicated, would need new skills. And when you are talking about new chemistries, there's, a, there's an element of safety. So we have to have uh, in uh, being compliant with uh, climate change, be good environmental stewards that we are able to do recycling. And I think uh, the, the risk that uh, Chandra has talked about in terms of uh, who wants to finance, if you are looking at the amount of people that don't have connectivity, you then say anybody who's going to invest would have a greater market share. So it's going to be a first mover uh, market that would uh, determine. And also if you're considering that some of our developing countries, including South Africa, have abundance of minerals. So with what Vicky was saying in terms of private partnership, in terms of funding, there can be funding structure between your mining houses and uh, your utilities. Thanks for the question, Varun. Thank you, Ankulu. Anybody else want to opine before we move on to our next question? Sure, I can jump in. Go ahead, Vicky. I think as we talk about scaling finance, whatever the tool is, one of the things in, in new tech is, is technology risk. But in emerging markets or, or any market around the world, there's there's a whole host of risk profiles associated with a project. Construction risk, political risk, financial risk, let alone the technology risk. And as we think about scaling storage, and those projects moving forward in a variety of different locations with different price signals, different policy and regulatory environments which are really critical to utilizing all of the use cases and functionality to make storage systems economical. That distribution of risk and who is best allocated to take on that risk becomes really important. And so whether that tool at a multilateral development bank or a development finance institution will have more comfortable with political risk or country risk in an emerging market. Technology risk oftentimes is not the thing that there are major government institutions are as comfortable funding. And so developing new instruments or thinking about project structures, uh, different allocations of debt and equity um, that can be, that can change to bring these things to scale after you've demonstrated, because every utility likes to be first to be second. Um, after you develop that comfort level, thinking through that risk allocation profile is going to become really critical to finding cheap sources of capital and moving projects forward to scale. Over. Terrific. And, and Eric, do you want to ask anything? I've got another question coming straight to you. So go ahead. Well, well in that case, um, the, the, the next question, which is critical to what we're talking about here in this exciting new phase of mission innovation, is how do we make multilateral partnerships support innovation? And this isn't just a motherhood and apple pie question. Countries may very well ask, well, if we're competing in this global new battery market, how can we collaborate globally if each of us is seeking to develop the technologies to win a substantial share of these growing battery markets? And so I'd love to hear, and perhaps we'll start with you, Eric, I'd love to hear if you have you know, concrete examples of how countries can work together at different stages of the innovation process in energy storage technologies, all the way from the very basic research through uh, the development, the demonstration, and ultimately the scale up, as we were just talking about, the testing and the scale up of these emerging technologies in new markets. How can countries best work together? Can we start with you, Eric, given that uh, a lot of the work you lead is at the early end of this uh, uh, technology roadmap? Sure. Um, and for that, I would point to an example. Um, one of the points that Makulu had brought up was on safety. And, and I think, um, uh, you know, in the end, for a product to be vi viable, um, the end users need to be able to trust that it's work and that it's safe. And I think one of the places that um, we have been collaborating and are, can be very fruitful for collaboration is on open, um, is on being able to share the operational experiences of mm -hmm. systems in the field. Uh, so, for example, the, the DOE storage program collaborates uh, internationally on fire and safety codes um, already with um, 
uh, with the existing lithium ion installed stationary storage base. And I think that's very important to allay the fears of you know, users and local permitting authorities, um, especially when um, the performance of a new chemistry may not be known. Um, I also think that uh, in the earlier R&D stages, it's important to uh, be able to see into what the ultimate use will be. I mean, I think a lot of the times uh, R&D uh, criteria may be looking at very myopic targets. And so collaborating at the early stages to say, okay, what are all of the different ways in which uh, your end users envision you using this product? I think that can feed back earlier and earlier into the R&D cycle so that we can reduce the time to commercialization and then uh, have a higher confidence that when a technology leaves the lab, it will be ready to perform in ways that the users uh, will find beneficial. That's a great answer. Thanks, Eric. Anybody else want to share examples of multilateral cooperation? V v Varun, uh, if I may, we, we have lessons from COVID which have uh, set a template for multilateral, multination collaboration because when we are talking climate change and uh, when we are talking energy access, it's now a universal and a global problem. And uh, we understand that where we don't have equality of skills, there is a need to accelerate. And part of the acceleration is where students uh, study in different countries. And when you are talking about uh, these uh, global collaborations towards solving a problem, Vicky and yourself, Arun, talk about the Biden-Harris uh, commitment to climate change. And therefore, we have to stop and ask if we have to learn anything from COVID with regards to energy. What is it and what plans do we start to put in place? We have seen what happened about uh, the fires in Australia that went for a long time. We know what happens in the, U uh, in the U.S. around uh, the West Coast. So now the question is, if we are not going to be intentional about having a way of uh, international collaboration, and we talk of uh, instability and as uncertainties. We would not have access to those minerals that we need to have energy storage. And therefore there has to be the calmness of minds, the planning and the execution of good policies. Thank you. That is very well said. Thank you, Nkulu. Um, any, any closing thoughts from uh, Chandra or from Vicky? Sure. Uh, no, you know, we have really seen the energy storage partnership as a forum, multilateral forum, where our client countries uh, from across the world are benefiting a lot from sharing information, uh, from sharing experience uh, across projects that are being implemented in, in, in Western countries, as well as from other uh, developing countries. So th that's, uh, you know, we had, uh, you know, colleagues from Gambia, we have had colleagues from China and other places sharing their experience of, uh, and Korea also, where there were a lot of fires on lithium ion. We have undertaken a review of that and uh, shared our experience with other colleagues. Thanks. Thanks, Chandra. All right, Vicky, you've got the last word. Oh man, that's that's daunting. I, I think the, the thing about global cooperation is identifying someone who has that shame, same shared experience who can relate to you. Um, just like the U.S. is not monolithic, um, there are places throughout the United States that best identify with a, a different country around the world. Hawaii doesn't have the same issues that D.C. has, that Arizona, California, Chicago, my hometown. And so as we look globally and start to share best practices, you see exchanges in the U.S. for utilities, but those don't need to be within the borders of one country. And the work that the World Bank and others are doing to facilitate those international dialogues I think we have a lot to learn and it's a two-way street and only through increased learning, increased dialogue, increased capital flows back and forth, that's really going to drive the response that we need for storage to come in and, and ultimately help us achieve our decarbonization goals. Thank you. That's terrific. Well, well, thank you, Vicky, and, and thanks to all of our fantastic uh, speakers. 
We're so excited from the standpoint of the United States, from the Biden-Harris administration about this next phase of mission innovation and for reinvigorated U.S. leadership uh, in clean energy innovation and the transition. Um, thrilled to, to uh, have everybody here for this important event on this important topic of energy storage and hope you enjoy the rest of this uh, terrific uh, week. It's great to, to see everybody. Thanks again for the time. and. Uh, signing off from here in Washington, D.C. and around the world.